Hey guys, it's Jack here with you, and today I've put together for you three of the craziest cases in my opinion. Which case gives you the creeps? Let me know in the comments. As you begin to explore the Leslie Palacio case, it is impossible not to feel bewildered and disappointed that justice has not yet been served. The killer remains at large, even though the police have all the evidence and his identity is known to them. Today's story underscores the difficulty of investigating crimes when suspects find themselves outside the jurisdiction and victims can only hope that the perpetrators will be found and brought to justice. The morning of the 29th brought anxiety to the home of Rusalia Palacio, mother of five lovely daughters. Her eldest daughter, Kayla, came down to the kitchen and reported that the bed in Leslie's room was untouched, her belongings were gone, and she clearly hadn't spent the night at home. One of the sisters joked that it must have been a pretty fun night at the club, and Leslie had probably stayed the night at Eric's. In fact, everyone became alarmed, since Leslie had never done this before. Over breakfast, Kayla kept glancing at her phone, expecting a waking Leslie to be about to text. Time passed, but still no word from Leslie. By noon, it stopped seeming normal. By late afternoon, Rosalia decided to go to Eric's house on her own and find out where her daughter had disappeared to. When the Palacio family members drove up to the house, they saw Eric's mother and his sister actively removing pieces of furniture and miscellaneous items from the house. Obviously, taking furniture out of the house is quite normal, but the situation itself and Mrs. Ibarra's crying face caused a very strange feeling for Rosalia. Something was not right here. When asked where Leslie was and why Eric's phone was unavailable, Eric's mother and sister pretended that they didn't even know that the couple had spent the evening together. Rosalia once again clarified whether Leslie had slept over at their house that night because she knew from her daughter's messages that she was going to Eric's house. After receiving a negative response, Leslie's family realized the seriousness of what was happening. Fears became reality, and the family immediately took action. The older sister, realizing that Leslie could not have disappeared so easily, began calling local hospitals and searching the internet for reports of accidents in the last 24 hours. However, the search was unsuccessful, as were attempts to contact Eric. He had either turned off his phone or the phone was deed, as Kayla couldn't even hear the voicemail. Rosalia had no choice but to call the police. The next day, August 30th, Leslie was officially reported missing. The move was the first in an intense fight for justice. Leslie Palacio was born on May 5, 1998, in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. Her short but full life was full of love and caring for her family. Always open and friendly girl became a source of joy in any company, as she valued everyone she met in her life and was reciprocated. Leslie dreamed of connecting her life with medicine. After graduating from high school, she entered the Las Vegas Medical College. In 20 was 20, she was already confidently moving towards her dream of becoming a phlebotomist and worked part-time as a lab technician combining theoretical knowledge with practical skills. Leslie proved herself to be a talented student. Her academic achievements were admirable. She was able to easily assimilate new material and always strive to deepen her knowledge. That is why the girl decided to work part-time as a laboratory assistant. Unexpectedly, Leslie realized that she had found her calling and soon became an integral part of the team. Colleagues considered the student not only a responsible and professional lab technician, but also a warm, responsive person. The girl's duties included conducting various analyses and tests, but for Leslie, this work was much more than just a fulfillment of duties. She saw her calling in the ability to make the process of taking tests as comfortable as possible for patients. Her caring and patience created an atmosphere of trust and even those who were apprehensive about the procedure felt at ease in her presence. When the youngest of the nurses asked if Leslie was afraid of getting her hands pierced all the time, 
She laughingly replied that she now had a super ability to poke people. The young optimist's vitality was evident in her every action. By all accounts, Leslie had the unique potential to become a sought-after and valuable specialist in the field of medical laboratory diagnostics, and she would have, if not for a dramatic turn of events. Leslie has been used to helping and caring for everyone since childhood. As the second of five daughters, she took on the role of mother when Roselia Palacio worked as a hotel cleaner. Roselia recalled her daughter kicking her out of the kitchen when she tried to cook dinner after cleaning more than 15 hotel rooms in a shift. Get some rest, Leslie gently urged her. Wanting to relieve her mother's burden after work, her daughter took it upon herself to prepare dinners and, in her characteristic easygoing manner, found cooking to be a source of inspiration. From then on, she always made sure her family members were very well fed, and even if she was away and couldn't make the family dinner herself, she always called home to make sure everyone had eaten. For Leslie, family came first, and she easily inspired her sisters with her energy and ideas. For example, even during the pandemic, Leslie didn't let sports disappear by organizing workouts in the backyard of the house. She taught her mother various exercises, and with her sisters she danced daily in front of the mirror to music. Her love of experimenting with hair color and image turned it into a joint business plan with her older sister to open a boutique. The sisters began designing and sewing dresses at home in their own unique style. When the coronavirus pandemic happened and Roselia was laid off due to downsizing, Leslie suggested her mother start her own small cleaning company and assured her that she would definitely help her with the cleanings in her free time from work and school. Mom, we'll be fine soon, you'll see, she assured Roselia. At a family council, they came up with a name for the company, the Palacio Cleaning Service. At the time Leslie disappeared, her dreams were just beginning to be realized. Their family firm had landed its first contract. But on August 29, 2020, all of the Palacio family's plans and dreams came crashing down. At the end of August 2020, Leslie completed the lab assistant program, and the family firm also received a large order. The girl decided it was time to take a break from the stresses and worries and enjoy an evening of dancing and fun. Especially the restrictions due to the pandemic were gradually being lifted and Las Vegas began to come alive. Unfortunately, none of the friends wanted to keep Leslie company. Although people were beginning to let go of their fears and return to their normal lives, they still felt nervous and anxious at the prospect of being in a closed space with lots of people. Leslie didn't give up hope of convincing someone to have fun and posted a post on Instagram expressing her desire to spend the evening somewhere. Unexpectedly, she received a message from Eric Rangel Ibarra. Leslie and Eric's parents had been attending the same church for 14 years and occasionally socialized. So the children had known each other since childhood, but had never interacted closely. Leslie knew what Eric liked. The guy texted her, showed her attention, but Leslie never reciprocated. She was polite to him, however. On any other day, Leslie would have declined Eric's desire to keep her company, but not this time. She was eager to dilute her ordinary life with a fun evening. The whole day passed in anticipation and anticipation. And when none of Leslie's friends wanted to keep her company, she accepted Eric's polite and warm offer to reminisce about Las Vegas nightlife. Sharing a night out with Eric seemed like a better choice than going nowhere at all. Expecting a fun adventure, Leslie had no idea what horrible events awaited her, but she probably had a premonition of something, trying to rationalize to herself that there was no cause for concern. Anyway, Leslie agreed with her sister that she would send her regular messages telling her exactly where she was. She also told Kayla in great detail where she was going and with whom and what places she might end up in. After a while, the older sister received a strange message. Can you believe Eric is totally not going to drink this evening? We're at a party, 
but it looks like I'm going to have to party alone. Afterward, the sisters exchanged joking messages on the topic of healthy living. The first place Eric and Leslie went to was the casino at the Longhorn Hotel. Police officers would later see on surveillance footage of the couple getting out of a white Ford F-250 owned by Eric at 0.31 a.m. on Ayug 29 and entering the casino, then leaving a short time later at 1.56 a.m. The couple would then leave the casino. Leslie kept in contact with her sister, telling her what was going on. At 4.40 a.m., Leslie sent her sister another strange message. I need to talk to you about something shitty. Kayla asked what happened and, according to her, a text box popped up, as if Leslie had started to reply, but no answer ever came. That text message was the last of the girl's life. The morning of the 29th came. Leslie still hadn't returned home. The more time passed, the more concerned the Palacio family members became. The certainty that Leslie had stayed the night at Eric's house was replaced by confusion, and the family went to a familiar house, where they found a strange scene. Mrs. Ibarra and her daughter were taking out furniture, pretending that they had heard for the first time that Leslie and Eric had spent the evening together. In fact, Leslie's family arrived at Eric's house just in time. If they had arrived a few hours later, the investigation would have been significantly delayed. The police found traces of blood in the house, a mess in the bedroom, which suggests that Eric's mother and his sister spent the whole day, strangely enough, not to clean up the traces of the crime, but to pack things down to the pieces of furniture. The family was clearly not going on a picnic, but planning a long-term and thorough absence. Most likely, they had arranged to reunite with Eric and his father, Jose, in Mexico, where the two had traveled in order to escape justice. Upon seeing the Palacio family, Mrs. Ibarra probably realized that the chance to leave was gone, leaving evidence in the house that no one would take the time to clean up. Panicked, mother and daughter began to simply deny knowing about Leslie and Eric's evening together. It was this behavior that led to the suspicion that something irreparable had happened. Fortunately, the Las Vegas police took immediate action and sent out a billing inquiry intending to track Leslie's movements since the previous night. But unfortunately, it takes some time to get that data, while the Palacios couldn't sit back and wait. The family started a campaign to spread the word about Leslie's disappearance. People responded and began actively sharing the information on social media. No one expected that there would be so many people who cared. Eric's mom especially didn't expect it. Detectives kept asking more and more questions, and on August 31st, Mrs. Ibarra went to the police station and filed a missing persons report for her husband and son. Mrs. Ibarra told police that her son, Eric, left home late in the evening on August 28th. And when he returned the next morning, he was acting strangely. She saw him walk out the door and never returned. The police noticed a strange circumstance. Not only was Leslie missing, but Eric was also missing, as well as his father. Based on this, an investigation into the triple disappearance began, with the Las Vegas police involved. Detectives turned to the residents of the neighborhood with the hope of finding surveillance cameras that recorded something important. Luck smiled. It was discovered that just across the street from Jose Barra's home, there were surveillance cameras. In addition to the CCTV footage, police obtained billing data that allowed them to track Leslie's movements in the early morning hours of the 29th. Detectives found that the couple went to the casino and afterward to a grill bar, which they reached around 02.15 a.m. Accidentally or not, Leslie's cell phone was left at the bar and the records show that Leslie left the establishment around 5.50 a.m., which is quite early in the morning. At 0605 a.m., neighborhood cameras captured Eric's car pulling up to the family home. The nature of his assistance to Leslie in getting out of the car and on the way to the house clearly indicated that the girl was heavily intoxicated. At 0725 a.m., Eric and his father, Jose, 
are seen carrying Leslie's body out of the house, wrapped in a sheet and placing it in the trunk of the car. Eric then drives away while Jose hoses down the driveway to their house. These actions clearly indicated that Eric and Jose were not missing, but were fugitives from justice. After police saw the footage, a search warrant was obtained for Ibarra's home. As a result, detectives uncovered a lot of additional evidence showing that Leslie had not left the house voluntarily. The house had been cleaned with cleaning products in an unsuccessful attempt. Latex gloves and trash bags were also found. But the most important piece of evidence was the discovery in Eric's room. Traces of blood were found on the floor and on Eric's bed, an obvious sign of assault. And without DNA testing, it was clear to investigators that the blood belonged to Leslie. From that point on, Leslie Palacio was no longer missing, and investigators focused their efforts on finding her body. Eric and Jose were reported missing. As investigators searched diligently for suspects, the shaken Palacio family made efforts as well. Ruselia asked members of the church community to help search for her daughter's body as search volunteers. Flyers and posters with Leslie's photo and images of Eric and Jose appeared on social media, newspapers, and street polls. The Palacio family is asking the public to intervene and help them find these two men involved in the girl's death, was the message on each flyer. The first major breakthrough in the investigation came when a license plate reader spotted Eric's car just six miles from his home around 10 a.m. August 29. He was heading back to his home just four hours after Leslie's alleged murder. The information uncovered made investigators realize that the location where Eric may have hidden the body was within a four-hour drive of his home on the Nevada-Arizona border or the Charleston Peak side, which is a huge area. So detectives were desperate for any additional information that could help them determine a more precise location. Once again, Luck smiled on them when footage was recorded at a gas station 40 miles north of Las Vegas, showing Eric's car pulling off the highway toward the Valley of Fire National Park. The car backed up 20 minutes later with muddy tires. The find narrowed the search and pointed to the possible location of the body within 20 miles of the gas station. The mud on the tires suggested that Eric had driven off the road at some point, Detectives began searching the area. Police and volunteers combed through hundreds of acres of land. And on Sept. 9, during a second search, they found Leslie Palacio's body hidden near a bush. News outlets immediately spread the word. The body of 22-year-old Leslie Palacio has been found near the Valley of Fire, 11 days after she disappeared. A reporter joined the report, providing additional details about the prime suspect 25-year-old Eric Rangel Ibarra. The Valley of Fire, where the body was found, is known for its hot climate, which led to rapid decomposition of the remains, and forensic experts were unable to determine the exact cause of death. Locals reacted to Leslie's death with horror and fear. Some became afraid to go outside because of the constant thoughts of the unquote criminals involved in the murder. The day after the body was discovered, September 10th, Many friends, relatives, neighbors, and just random people in the area gathered to honor Leslie's memory. People took candles that were used for the nightly vigil and placed them in front of the girl's house. They also said they wanted the man responsible for her death to pay for what he did. The fight for justice was not even close to being over at this point. The next major breakthrough came when Eric's car flashed in Moreno Valley, California. Police eventually contacted Eric's cousin, and he reported that he had driven Jose and his son to San Isidro, where he believed they planned to cross the border into Mexico. The Las Vegas Police Department requested assistance from the FBI because it was not possible for them to resolve the jurisdictional issue on their own. The investigation slowed down. Then, on January 19, 2021, four months after the discovery of the girl's remains, Eric's father, Jose, turned himself in at the border. Everyone was greatly relieved that at least one fugitive was now in custody. The man was quickly extradited back to Clark County and charged with destruction of evidence and accessory to murder. 
During interrogations, Jose tried to minimize his involvement in the crime, explaining the story of the trip to Mexico by his son's strange behavior on the morning of August 29th. However, investigators showing surveillance video footage debunked his false claims. The footage clearly showed him helping carry Leslie's body out of the house and washing the driveway. Faced with the evidence, Jose changed his testimony. He said he was working in the garage when Eric brought Leslie's body, wrapped in a sheet, into the garage. According to Jose, he panicked and helped his son load the body into the truck, assuming that Leslie had died of an overdose of illegal drugs because he saw no visible injuries on the body. Court documents indicate that Jose initially told police that, according to Eric, Leslie died of an overdose of illegal drugs. Jose also explained that Eric immediately talked about wanting to end his life, blamed himself, and so he decided that the best thing to do for his son was to take him to Mexico. When investigators asked Jose for Eric's current whereabouts, he explained that as soon as the two of them entered Mexico and boarded the bus, the bus was searched by Mexican authorities. He and his son got scared and decided to split up, thinking that apart it would be harder for the authorities to find them. For this reason, he would love to help the investigation, but has absolutely no idea where his son might be. On June 18, 2021, Jose formally pleaded guilty to destruction of evidence and accessory to murder. Despite the horrific characteristics of his crimes, Jose Ibarra was sentenced to only two years in the Clark County Detention Center, causing shock and dismay in the community. The Palacio family was shocked and outraged by Jose's lenient sentence, which they felt was unjust. During the pandemonium, Jose Ibarra joined the court proceedings virtually, while Leslie's family and friends attended in person. They urged the judge to impose a harsher sentence, arguing that two years was not enough for an accessory to murder who helped dispose of the body and hid the perpetrator. Jose Ibarra pleaded guilty and tried to apologize to Palacio's family, saying his love for his son outweighed him. He expressed regret for his actions. However, Leslie's family did not accept his apology and did not consider it sincere. To date, Eric's whereabouts remain unknown and he continues to live a free life in Mexico. Jose was released on April 28, 2022. Ophelia Marcarien, attorney and representative of the Palacio family, commented as follows. I am absolutely furious. This is simply unfair. Not only is the main suspect not in custody, now the one who was involved in covering up the murder is back in custody after serving eight months and 15 days. Over the past three years, the Palacio family has never gotten justice. Leslie's story highlights the flaws in the justice system and raises questions about fairness in dealing with serious crimes. The Palacio family is determined to fight to change the law in Nevada because they believe that whoever was involved in the murder should receive a longer prison sentence than two years. They hope that the perpetrator will be found and prosecuted in the United States, where he will be charged and given the punishment he deserves. Ophelia Marcarian is directly reaching out to those who may know of Eric's whereabouts in Mexico. In every media interview, she calls for Palacio's family to be given a small measure of justice. Greed, envy, and the desire to get wealth without much effort often push people to commit the most heinous and cynical crimes. Sometimes it is hard to imagine what cruelty a person is capable of for the sake of quick enrichment, for example, the murder of a close relative. The story of Elizabeth Vasquez is truly shocking and horrifying. This kind and hardworking woman all her life worked for the good of her family, striving to give her beloved daughter all the best, including a good education. But the greedy heiress, along with her boyfriend, did the unthinkable. This complex case for several years stirred the press and shocked the public with its inhumanity, showing how a young woman can easily decide to kill her own mother. Let's try to understand how in a prosperous and well-to-do family grew a real monster, devoid of any feelings of pity, remorse, or conscience. The large and happy Vasquez family. 
1967, in the town of Cajamarca in northwestern Peru, a girl named Elizabeth Lillian Vasquez Movila was born. She was the oldest of six children in the family of Ernesto Vasquez and Maria Movila. Her parents were hard-working, simple people who worked hard to provide for their many offspring, give them an education and a chance at a better life. The Vasquez family was friendly and very happy, and from an early age, Elizabeth helped her mother take care of her younger siblings. She was an excellent student and graduated from school with honors, which allowed her to easily enter the prestigious university at the Faculty of Law and Economics. While at the university, she met a young man named Alejandro Mendez Espino, who was also studying law and was known as one of the top students in his class. A romantic relationship quickly developed between the two, which grew rapidly, and they were officially married in 1987, even before graduating from university. Elizabeth's parents approved of her choice from the very beginning and gladly accepted her son-in-law into the family. Alejandro was a serious, intelligent, ambitious, and very purposeful man who could take good care of their eldest daughter. At first, the newlyweds lived in the Vasquez family home, but after six months, when Elizabeth became pregnant, they decided to move into their separate home. Only daughter. Approximately a year after their marriage in 1988, the couple welcomed their only joint heir, whom they named after the mother, Elizabeth Vasquez Espino. Affectionately called Elita in the family, the girl became the center of attention for all her numerous relatives and the main joy of her parents. Several years after the birth of their daughter, the couple, whose careers were steadily ascending, decided to move to Peru's capital, Lima. By then, Alejandro was vying for a prosecutor position in an anti-corruption department, while Elizabeth had opened her own legal consulting firm. Both worked tirelessly for the benefit of their family, but unfortunately couldn't spend enough time with their young daughter. Confronted with an unsatisfactory experience hiring a nanny who didn't fulfill her duties conscientiously, the young mother decided to send her daughter to her parents in Calla Marca for them to take care of the heiress. Maria and Ernesto readily agreed and were overjoyed to have their granddaughter live with them for a while. Notably, their youngest daughter, Giovanna, Alita's aunt, was only a couple of years older than Alita, so they immediately got along and interacted like real sisters. Due to their total commitment to work, the parents rarely saw their daughter and compensated by showering her with gifts during visits. Alita's stay at her grandparents' home stretched over several years, and when her parents decided to bring her back to their home in Lima, she had already started school. It's worth noting that the abrupt change in environment did not benefit the girl, and she took quite some time to adapt to life in the bustling, noisy capital after the quiet, almost provincial Cajamarca. The Challenging Parent-Daughter Relationship as a child, Elita was a quiet and well-behaved kid. She strove to excel academically, engaging in music and foreign languages. She shared a warm and trusting relationship with her parents, who tried to compensate for the years of enforced separation. Elizabeth aimed to be not just a mother, but also Elita's best friend, someone she could share her deepest thoughts with. This remained true until Elita turned 15. During her teenage years, Alita's character deteriorated rapidly. She became rude, threw tantrums, and stopped listening to her parents. She abandoned her studies, got involved with bad company, and worst of all, began stealing money from her parents' wallets. Elizabeth tried various approaches to connect with her daughter, hoping it was just a phase that Alita would outgrow. However, the girl regularly instigated heated arguments with her mother, ending in hysterics and tears. During these moments, Alejandro typically remained neutral, but if Alita sought his intervention, he often took her side. Alita was deeply hurt and offended by being constantly compared to her smart, beautiful, successful, and hardworking mother. Next to Elizabeth, Alita indeed appeared as the ugly duckling, being the complete opposite of her mother in every aspect. She lacked striking looks, was overweight, lazy, and temperamental, often lied, and didn't shy away from theft. Elita harbored numerous complexes about her appearance. When she expressed a desire for plastic surgery, Elizabeth, eager to please her daughter and mend their relationship, didn't dissuade her. Elizabeth financed an initial rhinoplasty for her daughter, and a few years later, several more surgeries. 
In 2007, after 20 years of marriage, Alejandro and Elizabeth decided to separate. Their 18-year-old daughter reacted with a hysterical outburst, screaming, insulting, and blaming her mother for driving her father away. At the time, the family was in the United States, and the divorce posed some complications for citizens of another country. Nonetheless, they returned home as divorced individuals and began living separately. By mutual agreement, the now adult but still dependent daughter stayed in her mother's house. They continued to have fierce arguments, and during such moments, Elita would call her father, crying and begging him to take her in. However, Alejandro, who had moved on with a new love, was not eager to do so. He always convinced Alita to reconcile with her mother and wait a bit longer until she finished university and started an independent life. Despite her plummeting academic performance, terrible character, and provocative behavior, Elita's parents ensured she enrolled in the law faculty of one of Peru's most prestigious universities. The education was costly, but her father and mother decided not to skimp on the education of their only child. Elita's unreliable boyfriend, Elita, had her fair share of teenage romances, but at 19, she fell genuinely in love for the first time. It all started one Sunday morning at church, where she met a charming young man named Fernando Gonzalez. He couldn't take his eyes off her during the service, and afterward, he approached her to introduce himself. To Alita, Fernando seemed like a prince, handsome, attentive, with a pleasant voice. He invited her for coffee and a chat. As it turned out, he had a habit of scouting churches for young, well-dressed girls who arrived in luxury cars, then would strike up a conversation, charm them, and play on their sympathies. He'd spin tales about his difficult childhood in a large family abandoned by their father, how he was now supporting his mother, brothers, and sisters by working multiple jobs. Wealthy and naive girls would sympathize and give him money. Sometimes he managed to maintain a wealthy girlfriend for a few months, but typically they'd leave him once the truth was revealed. He was just an unemployed slacker who loved the high life. Elita fell easily into Fernando's trap due to her complexes. Always considering herself unattractive, she couldn't believe such a handsome man noticed her and was ready to give him everything she had, or rather, everything her mother had. She opened up to her mother about everything, leading to their first candid conversation in years. Elizabeth thought she had a chance to mend their relationship, especially since Elita had met the boy in church, which seemed promising and assumed he must be a good person. Upon their first meeting, Fernando managed to make a positive impression on Elizabeth. He told her his dramatic life story, and she believed him, deciding that such a good boy deserved help. She rented a cozy apartment for him near central Lima, agreeing to pay 70% of the monthly rent. She also paid for his business school tuition, promising him a job in her company later on. It seemed that Fernando gratefully accepted her generosity, ready to start studying. However, he had no interest in attending boring lectures or working. He just wanted to have fun and spend someone else's money. He gladly moved into the rented apartment but never paid anything towards it, claiming to be broke and promising to pay back later. Soon it became clear that Fernando only attended a couple of business school classes before quitting. After a serious talk with Elizabeth, he seemed remorseful. She decided to give him a second chance and employed him as a courier in her company. On his very first day, he not only failed to complete a simple task, but also betrayed other employees who had entrusted him with important documents. Elizabeth finally realized that this young man had charmed her daughter only to leech off her for his own needs. He had no intentions of studying or working. She then forbade Alita from seeing him, which provoked her daughter's anger and resentment. Alita screamed and cried, accusing her mother of trying to ruin her life and take away her happiness. She refused to listen to reason and insisted she would continue seeing Fernando. Failed attempt to separate the couple. Elizabeth decided to send her daughter to her parents' home for a while, naively believing that if Alita didn't see her boyfriend for a few months, her feelings would cool down and Fernando would find another rich fool to exploit. But Elizabeth was greatly mistaken. Elita continued to communicate with her boyfriend through calls and social media, and her resentment towards her mother only grew. Fernando had to move out of the rental apartment after Elizabeth refused to pay for it. However, he found a smaller place, rented for him by his young lover with her mother's money. 
Alita had some financial freedom, being a spoiled child, and could freely use some of her mother's accounts. When the summer break ended and university resumed, Alita immediately rushed to meet her boyfriend, who once again asked her for money. She withdrew a substantial amount from her mother's account and gave it to him, leading to a serious confrontation with her mother later that evening upon noticing the missing funds. Elizabeth then decided to block Alita's access to her accounts, giving her only a small weekly allowance for personal expenses. This decision further strained their already tense relationship. They barely spoke, mainly engaged in arguments, and Elizabeth's attempts to reach out to her daughter were unsuccessful. The monstrous plan. During one of their romantic dates, when Alita couldn't bring Fernando the money he demanded, he became furiously angry. He cursed Elizabeth, screaming that she had plenty of money but wouldn't give any to her only daughter, then added that if Elizabeth were gone, adult Alita would inherit all her wealth, and they could live luxuriously. This terrible idea took root in Alita's mind, growing stronger each day. She constantly talked about how much she hated her mother, blamed her for all her misfortunes, and fantasized about how wonderful it would be if her mother disappeared. The young lovers began to devise a monstrous and cynical plan to eliminate Vasquez, also considering whom they could involve as accomplices. At that time, Elizabeth had nearly $3 million in her accounts, owned a successful business that could be sold, a large house in an elite area of the capital, several cars, and her life was insured for a significant amount. In the event of her death, all of this would be inherited by her only child, Elita. Elizabeth seemed to sense danger. She realized she couldn't separate her daughter from the mercenary and deceitful young man who negatively influenced her. The situation was escalating and could resolve in the most unpredictable way. Being an experienced lawyer, Elizabeth drafted a will stating that in case of her sudden disappearance or untimely death, all money and property should go to Ernesto Vasquez, her father. She even managed to visit her parents and tell them about her decision. Meanwhile, Elita planned to stage the kidnapping and murder of her own mother by suspected criminals who would never be found. She and Fernando decided to involve a tough guy, Jorge Carnejo Ruiz, promising to pay him generously for his services. He accepted the offer without a second thought. A crime against his own mother. On January 24, 2010, 21-year-old Alita met with her 23-year-old boyfriend to finalize the plan for the crime that was to take place the next day. She was calm and collected, already envisioning how she would spend the millions she had inherited. The next morning, January 25th, citing ill health, Alita did not go to the university and stayed home. When her mother left for work, Fernando and Jorge were already lurking outside the house, waiting for Alita to distract the guard and sneak them inside. Alita approached the guard on duty and asked him to buy painkillers from the nearest pharmacy, which was only a five-minute walk away. This brief absence allowed the young men to sneak into the house and hide in the master bedroom. When Elizabeth returned, Alita loudly dropped a glass in the kitchen, signaling her attackers to gather. When Elizabeth entered her room, Fernando knocked her to the ground and began choking her, with Jorge holding her down. Miraculously, Elizabeth managed to break free and run out into the hallway, where her own daughter kicked her in the head. While Elizabeth was unconscious, they tied her up. However, their plans were disrupted by a young servant girl, Maria Celine, whom Elita tricked into another room and locked her in. When Elizabeth regained consciousness, her daughter, boyfriend, and their accomplice brutally tortured her, trying to find out the code to the safe and passwords to her bank accounts. Terrified, Elizabeth knew her daughter was in trouble, but had always blamed it on Gonzalez's bad influence. Now, however, she saw the monstrous nature of her only daughter. Elizabeth managed to loosen the restraints and fought back against her daughter, scratching and punching her until Fernando knocked her to the ground. An enraged Alita kicked her mother and finally, in a fit of rage, grabbed a pillow and smothered her until she stopped showing signs of life. The trio then bound the lifeless body, ducked taped her mouth shut, and placed Elizabeth in the trunk of her own car, staging a kidnapping. Elita then sent another guard to get medication, allowing her accomplices to drive off the property. She later freed a terrified Maria, falsely claiming that she and her mother had quarreled but made up, and that her mother had gone to bed. 
a strange story of a kidnapping and the search for a missing woman. In the morning, the maid was preparing breakfast as usual, but Alita came to the kitchen and told her that her mother had gone to work early because of an important meeting. After that, Alita left the house to go to her mother's workplace. There, she walked into the office of Jessica Hippo, her mother's best friend and accountant, and tearfully reported that her mother was missing and that she was receiving strange, threatening, and ransom calls. The accountant immediately started blocking the accounts to prevent the intruders from accessing them, reported the incident to the police, and left the office for a while. When she returned, Alita was gone and the office was in disarray, as if someone was looking for something. Later, it turned out that Elizabeth's will was missing, which Alita had learned about the day before by overhearing a telephone conversation. Using a key she had stolen from her mother, Alita had also taken a copy of the will and cash from the safe in her mother's study. Police arrived and inspected the house, interviewing the missing woman's daughter as well as the office staff, but gained no valuable information. All claimed that Vasquez had no enemies and no one had threatened her, so no one was initially listed as a suspect. The main theory was that it was a kidnapping for ransom. All that was left was to wait for a call from the criminals to receive further instructions and demands, a terrifying discovery and the first suspect. The day after Elizabeth's disappearance became known, it was reported that her car was found abandoned in a vacant lot outside of town. The interior was empty, but when law enforcement officers opened the trunk, they were shocked by what they found. Inside lay the lifeless body of a missing woman with signs of beatings. Forensic experts counted dozens of bruises, severe head trauma and rope marks on the victim's body, indicating that the woman had been tied up and tried to free herself. It was also determined that Vasquez's death was caused by asphyxiation. Particles of blood and epithelium were found under her fingernails, indicating that she had resisted. It was now necessary to determine who the blood belonged to. At the lineup, Alita appeared as a grief-stricken daughter. She cried, wailed, and seemed almost unconscious. However, at the interrogation, she behaved quite differently. She was calm, even cold-blooded, and the questions of the investigators she was visibly annoyed. In addition, she constantly contradicted herself in her testimony. When the police decided to check the information about the calls from the kidnappers and sent a request to the cell phone company, it turned out that Elita did not receive any calls. It also turned out that in the days before and after her mother's disappearance, Elita had been in frequent contact with one Fernando Gonzalez, who they also decided to question. However, the young man either insisted on his innocence or remained silent. Irrefutable evidence and an arrest. Elizabeth's maternal grandparents were in charge of her funeral, while Elizabeth herself was indifferent, thinking only about how to get out of the situation, stay free and save money. She called her father, who was already aware of what had happened, and crying, told him of her innocence and asked for help. Her father advised her not to talk too much, and promised to get her out of the situation, even though he knew perfectly well who had committed the crime. However, he did not want his daughter to go to prison because it would have cast a shadow of shame on Alejandro, who at the time held the high office of justice of the peace and president of the Supreme Court, and was a powerful and respected man. Meanwhile, forensic results showed that the blood and skin particles under the deceased's fingernails belonged to her daughter. Alita tried to claim that she had a serious quarrel with her mother, and they briefly quarreled, but then made up. However, no one believed her anymore. Further inspection of Elizabeth's room with special equipment revealed numerous wiped traces of blood throughout the house, including in Alita's room, despite her attempts to wipe away the evidence. Alita's story that she had an argument with her mother in the evening, but then made up, and the claim that her mother left early for work the next morning and was never seen again, quickly fell apart. She contradicted herself, first saying she had not gone into her mother's room, and then remembering that she had. The ransom calls were completely fabricated by her. The testimony of the maid Maria Chalen played a decisive role in the case. She told how on the night of the crime, Alita locked her in a room from where she heard Elizabeth's screams and sounds of struggle, but could not help. After that night, she never saw her employer again, and Alita insisted that everything was fine with her mother, who had simply gone to work early. 
All of this led to the arrest of Alita and her boyfriend, the criminal trio, and the battle for the inheritance. Alita was arrested at her mother's house, her boyfriend was detained a few hours later at an entertainment establishment, and the next morning, Jorge was arrested, betrayed by Fernando, who tried to blame the crime on him. It is noteworthy that it was Gonzalez who first began to testify, hoping that cooperation with the investigation will benefit him and help to mitigate the sentence. Meanwhile, Alejandro hired the best lawyers for his daughter, but realized that she will not be able to escape punishment. At the same time, he began to deal with Vasquez's inheritance, intending to take it for himself. Since the will had disappeared and the heiress was facing a long prison sentence, he claimed that he and Elizabeth had never divorced but simply lived apart, remaining legally married. Meanwhile, Ernesto Vasquez, Alita's grandfather, decided to visit his favorite granddaughter in prison to look her in the eye, as he could not believe that the girl he had known and raised since infancy could commit such a horrible act. However, Alita behaved arrogantly, shouted, insulted the older man and stated that she did not wish to see him again. This encounter upset him greatly, leading to a heart attack from which he was unable to recover and died six months later. The Vasquez family was unable to prove the existence of the will left in Ernesto's name, as the document disappeared from Elizabeth's office and the notary's database, seemingly taken care of by Alejandro. All documents and references to the couple's divorce also mysteriously disappeared, giving Alejandro the right to claim the deceased's inheritance, the trial and the verdict. Despite attempts by Elita, Fernando and Jorge to shift the blame onto each other, the investigation successfully reconstructed the events of that fateful evening and established the role of each participant in the crime. It was also proven that the trio acted in a deliberate conspiracy, which greatly aggravated their guilt. A decisive role in the trial was played by the testimony of the maid Maria, who stated that Alejandro had threatened her, demanding that she give a different version of events, but she refused to comply. In May 2012, the court found all three defendants guilty. Initially, the prosecutor had requested that each participant in the murder be sentenced to 30 years' imprisonment. While the men pleaded guilty, Elita continually played the victim. Fernando and Jorge were eventually sentenced to 28 years each, but Elita's trial was delayed. Elita claimed that the perpetrators were hired by relatives on her mother's side, who fabricated the inheritance story in order to take possession of Elizabeth's property and money. Her father held the same version of events. Attempts to declare Elita mentally ill and susceptible to manipulation by criminals also failed. This strategy, proposed by Alejandro, was to send her to a psychiatric hospital instead of prison, declaring her insane and incapable of fully and solely inheriting his wife's estate. Finally, in December 2012, the court delivered its final verdict, sentencing Elita to the maximum term of 30 years in prison. To this day, she and her accomplices are serving their sentences in prison. As for the disputed inheritance, its fate remains unresolved. In the spring of 2021, Alejandro died without becoming the only heir. The Vasquez family through the court seeks to exclude Alita from the list of claimants to Elizabeth's property, citing the fact that she is in prison for murder. Currently, the main claimant for the inheritance is Maria Movila, Elizabeth's mother. According to psychologists, most often teenagers commit offenses for three reasons. The desire to assert themselves and gain authority among their peers, alcohol addiction or addiction to illegal drugs, but most importantly, a sense of impunity. Even for the most serious crimes, minors often receive minimal punishment because their young age is taken into account. In our story today, a schoolgirl named Mackenzie Sharilla became the perpetrator of a terrible tragedy that took two lives at once. However, the girl herself did not feel remorse for her crime and at the trial stated that she could do almost anything while staying alive, but she does not consider herself cool. Mackenzie repeatedly changed her testimony, writing off everything on a lapse in memory and apparently until the last moment was confident that she would get away with it. But the verdict of the judge literally dumbfounded the young criminal and her mother, so desperately defending her daughter. But let's get to the bottom of this. 
Who is Mackenzie Sharilla? Mackenzie Sharilla was born in August 2004 in the quiet town of Strongsville, Ohio, and was the third child in the family. Her parents, John Sharilla and Natalie Stevens, tried to bring up their heirs in love and care to give them a good education and encourage all endeavors. The youngest daughter was a family favorite. She was forgiven many pranks from childhood, and even serious misdemeanors often got away with it. Mackenzie grew up capricious, demanding, and selfish girl. She was used to the fact that parents always do as she requires, and was also confident in her own impunity, no matter what she did. Classmates and teachers of the girl noted that in childhood she was quite a nice and open child, but with age, her character and behavior began to deteriorate. The girl threw real tantrums. If something went wrong, she easily lost her temper, behaved impudently and impatiently, swore and could even get into a fight. Mackenzie did not consider anyone's opinion but her own. Her word should always be the last, and she put her own interests above all else. In adolescence, the character of the girl became simply unbearable, but her parents did not see anything terrible in this. Believing that her daughter has a transitional age, and she should be treated with understanding and patience. However, bad character was far from the worst of all the troubles. In high school, Mackenzie was addicted to alcohol, as well as sometimes dabbled in illegal drugs, but she got away with it. Often, the girl's actions were reckless and carried a direct threat not only to her, but also to the people around her. Parents still did not notice, or simply did not want to notice the obvious problem. Like many of her peers, Mackenzie was a big fan of social media and literally never let her smartphone out of her hands. She often posted provocative pictures of herself smoking or drinking alcohol on her account, and she left equally provocative comments on them. Mackenzie's friends were just like her. Together, they vandalized, organized pogroms, fights, sometimes stole, and several times came to the attention of the police. However, the young people were treated only with warnings and educational talks, which strengthened their belief in their own impunity. Dominique Rousseau, a young man named Dominic Rousseau, was also a native of Strongsville. He was born in September 2001 and was the fourth of seven children to his parents, Frank and Christine Rousseau. The boy was raised with three brothers and three sisters, with whom he was always very close. Dominic studied well in school, from childhood years actively engaged in sports, and tried to lead a healthy lifestyle. Despite the fact that he grew up in a large family, neither he himself nor any of his brothers or sisters was not deprived of parental love, attention, and care. Spouses Frank and Christine were moderately strict with their children, but at the same time promoted their all-round development. Dominic always had a lot of friends. He was used to being in the center of attention and became the soul of any company. The young man had a bright and quite attractive appearance, was trim and interesting, so he also had a lot of admirers from a young age. However, he himself tried to avoid fleeting romances, emphasizing serious and promising relationships. After graduating from high school, Russo became a student at a local university, choosing the specialization producer of performing arts. He dreamed of linking his life with music and one day becoming a famous music producer. In addition, the talented and versatile Dominic wrote and performed songs himself, by the age of 20, the guy already had his own small business. He bought a car and rented a separate apartment in a good neighborhood. At the same time, he continued to play sports and was considered one of the best students at the university. First love. Dominic and Mackenzie met for the first time when the girl studied in the graduating class. It happened at one of the parties in the company of mutual friends, and this accidental meeting became fatal for both of them. Young people were complete opposites of each other and opposites are known to attract. A handsome, curly-haired young man, well-versed in music, immediately attracted Mackenzie's attention. He was radically different from the guys she usually socialized with. He was educated, well-mannered, interesting, and could easily hold a conversation on any topic. Mackenzie herself had a striking appearance and slim figure, dressed well, and knew how to make the right impression. She turned on all her charm to draw the attention of the guy she liked, and she managed to achieve the desired rather quickly. In the fall of 2021, the couple began dating, and almost immediately each of them introduced the chosen one to their parents. 
But if Mackenzie's parents were delighted with her choice and considered Dominic a brilliant couple for their daughter, the parents of the guy had mixed feelings about his passport. On the one hand, the girl looked sweet, innocent, and tried to make a good impression on them. But on the other hand, something in her immediately alerted Frank and Christine Russo. Friends and family members of Cheryl were sure that Mackenzie, for the first time in her life, really fell in love and sincerely hoped that the relationship with the Chosen One will positively affect her character and behavior. Then no one could not even guess what tragedy would end this youthful romance. The couple began to appear everywhere together, holding hands and openly demonstrating their tender feelings for each other. So soon, the whole small town knew about the relationship. Those who knew Mackenzie well sincerely felt sorry for her boyfriend, but most just happy for them. What was wrong with her? Soon Dominic began to notice oddities in his girlfriend's behavior, her defiant antics and desire to make everyone around her do only what she wants. At first he did not focus too much attention on it, writing off everything on the young age and the desire to attract attention. The young people made plans for their future together, and even planned to get married as soon as Mackenzie turned 18. They also planned to leave their native provincial town and together go to conquer a major metropolis, ideally, New York. There before Dominic would open a lot of opportunities to build a brilliant career in the music industry and fully reveal his talent. But as time went on, Mackenzie's behavior became more and more alarming, and sometimes even frightened the guy. She demanded from her boyfriend that he did only what she wanted, and if he did not agree with her in something, she made scandals, threw tantrums, and behaved like a little capricious child. At first, Dominic tried to translate everything into a joke, but soon realized that this is the true face of his chosen one. In public, she was still trying to hold on, but being alone with her boyfriend spewed on him the whole storm of his emotions and sometimes even pounced on him with fists. Mackenzie's behavior became more and more aggressive, and at some point, the young man decided that he had enough. He suggested that she take a pause in the relationship and sort out her feelings. But upon hearing this, Mackenzie had a public showdown in front of their mutual friends. She screamed, threatened Dominic that she would kill him if he left her, threatened to burn down his house and wreck his car. But by doing so, she only made him feel more confident that he was doing the right thing by ending this toxic and unrewarding relationship. Obsessive stalking. Mackenzie had no intention of letting her boyfriend go, and at first she acted as if nothing had happened. She continued to call him, called him to various parties and other events, as well as exhibited in social networks of their joint photos, accompanying them with posts, with declarations of love. When Dominic firmly told her that everything is over between them, she literally went mad with anger and rage. Mackenzie went to his house almost daily and shouted all sorts of nasty things, insults and threats under his windows. She called him from different numbers, left messages on his answering machine, wrote on social media and emailed him. Mackenzie then swore in love and offered to try to start all over again, then again began to insult and threats. Russo was confused. He simply did not know how to react to such behavior, because he had never encountered such behavior. He tried talking, tried to ignore the former lover, and a couple of times even recorded her threatening tantrums on his phone. It got to the point that Sharilla, seeing the ex-boyfriend on the street or in another public place, began to scream and insult him in front of passers-by. She turned Dominic's life into a real nightmare, but he still hoped that a little more time would pass and she would leave him alone, switching to someone else. One day, in front of witnesses, Mackenzie declared that it was easier for her to kill Dominic than to let him go. Mackenzie said that if he didn't come back to her, no one would have him and she would take care of it. The young man did not take these words seriously, although those around him realized that Mackenzie was not joking. Among the most frequent threats from the mouth of the schoolgirl were promises to hit and run over the guy with a car, as well as to put him in the car and drive off a cliff or stop on the railroad in front of a train rushing at them. Each option sounded terrifying, and each of them Mackenzie described in detail, as if she had planned it all out long ago and was just waiting for the right moment. An Unexpected Reconciliation when Mackenzie realized that threats and insults would not help her to get Dominic back, but only distanced him, she decided to change her tactics. 
Mackenzie became sweet and charming again, stopped pressuring and harassing her ex-boyfriend, and instead tried her best to pretend that she realized her mistakes and wanted to change for the better. She talked about the upcoming enrollment, asked to help her choose a university, and also claimed that she had gotten smart and most of all was now concerned about the final exams. Such changes pleasantly surprised Dominic. He, in spite of everything, still had tender feelings for the former girlfriend and decided out of kindness to help her with university enrollment. Therefore, they again began to see each other and communicate. Gradually, the couple became close again. Dominic began to invite Mackenzie on dates, sought to spend all his free time with her, and believed that she had changed, matured, became more serious and responsible. He did not notice how he fell in love with her again, and all the former offenses remained somewhere in the past. However, this time the young people were in no hurry to announce to all friends and acquaintances about their reunion. Their meetings were more like secret dates, where they just enjoyed each other's company, avoiding the close attention of others. When Dominic's own brother Angelo learned about what was happening, he suggested that nothing good would come of it, but the young man in love did not heed his words. A devious plan. While Dominic naively rejoiced at being reunited with his girlfriend and the changes he thought had happened to her, Mackenzie herself hatched a terrifying plan of reprisal against the young man. She was so fascinated by the idea of a car and a spectacular car crash that she began to work out this scenario in detail. In her free time, she spent hours driving around the city, choosing a place suitable for the realization of her plan. However, there were no high and steep cliffs nearby, and going out on the tracks while waiting for a train seemed to her an unreliable idea. One day, Sharilla drove into a nearby industrial area, a fairly secluded place with no cameras on the way, and very few cars in the area. The schoolgirl's attention was drawn to a huge brick wall, and her sick imagination immediately conjured up a new, no less horrible plan. She decided that if she accelerated to the maximum possible speed and crashed into the wall, it would be no less spectacular than falling off a cliff into an abyss. It should be noted that initially Mackenzie planned to die together with her lover, so that their story was retold by all the inhabitants of the city. She even told her best friend about it, but her friend simply did not believe in the seriousness of her intentions because Mackenzie had visited such delusional ideas before, but everything was limited to empty conversations. A terrible realization of the plan and an accidental victim. At the end of July 2022, just a week before her coming of age, Mackenzie suggested to Dominic that they go to an upcoming party hosted by their mutual friends. It would be a good opportunity to have fun, to unwind, and to let everyone know that they were back together and loved each other dearly. The young man readily agreed. He still didn't feel threatened by Mackenzie and believed in the sincerity of her feelings and intentions. The event was scheduled for Saturday, July 30th. Dominique and Mackenzie appeared in the middle of the party, holding hands, which immediately attracted the attention of those present. They looked happy, smiled, and openly showed affectionate feelings for each other. Friends were sincerely pleased with their reunion and noted that they are a very beautiful and harmonious couple. All evening and all night, the young people had fun, willingly photographed and without shyness, kissed in front of everyone. But no one even guessed what a terrible tragedy would end this party. The couple drank a little, however, like everyone else at the event. But Mackenzie, secretly from everyone, took a dose of illegal drugs, so to speak, for courage, so as not to change his mind and at the last moment did not hit the brakes. In the morning, Russo and Sharilla said goodbye to everyone and headed for the car, but then a friend of the guy, Davian Flanagan, followed them and asked them to give him a ride home. Mackenzie tried to object, saying they had plans of their own, but Dominic saw no problem with giving his friend a ride. Not wanting to fight, arouse suspicion or change plans, Mackenzie agreed, signing Davian's death warrant. Despite her lover's objections, Mackenzie got behind the wheel of the car. Her boyfriend sat next to her in the passenger seat, and her friend sat behind him. The car started and slowly pulled away from the party venue, heading out on its most recent trip. On the main street, Mackenzie drove quietly, keeping to the speed limit and trying not to draw attention to herself. At a stoplight, she stopped, though the road was empty. 
Mackenzie once again considered her plan while her passengers dozed off. She later claimed that she wanted to die in the accident, but the perpetrator was obviously lying because she had fastened her seatbelt during the last stop while her passengers remained unbuckled. When the light turned green, she drove off, quickly picking up speed, and then took a sharp turn onto a poorly lit secondary road leading into an industrial area. Obviously, the guys didn't immediately realize what was going on, if at all. It was as if the devil himself had possessed the driver. The car accelerated to top speed, but Mackenzie continued to press hard on the gas pedal, steering the car into a blank brick wall. A bystander and a miraculous rescue. There wasn't a soul in the industrial area early Sunday morning, so no one saw the accident or rushed to help. Only one woman who lived on the outskirts, not far from the scene of the accident, heard the bang and was not too lazy to go outside to see what was the matter. She saw smoke, and when she got closer, she realized that there had been a car crash, after which she ran back inside to call emergency services. Medics arrived at the scene about half an hour after the accident, but the two guys in the car could not be helped. They died on the spot. The girl behind the wheel was alive. She was saved by her seatbelt and airbags. Mackenzie was unconscious, and her legs were trapped in the mangled car, but she was breathing, and her pulse was clearly palpable, giving hope that she would survive. She opened her eyes several times during the process of being released from the car, but was obviously unaware of what was going on around her. Mackenzie was immediately sent to the hospital where she was diagnosed with a number of fractures and internal organ damage. Blood tests showed that she was under the influence of alcohol and drugs. However, according to the doctor, perhaps that is what prevented her from dying from painful shock while help was on the way. Investigation, Leads, and Confession Initially, the police, having received the results of Mackenzie's tests, assumed that she, being under the influence of illegal substances, simply did not realize what she was doing and perhaps tried to drive through the wall or did not see any obstacles in her way. In favor of this version was the lack of braking distance. It was not possible to talk to Sharilla herself because she was unconscious in the intensive care unit after a complex operation. However, she soon came to her senses and realizing what she had done, began to sob and pour out her soul to the doctor on duty. She admitted that she purposely drove into the wall at a great speed because she wanted to kill her boyfriend and originally planned to die with him. Mackenzie also added that Davian was an accidental victim due to his own obsession because he asked to go with them. The doctor did not take the patient's rambling story seriously, deciding that it was a delusional state resulting from anesthesia and painkillers, as well as guilt over the death of a loved one. And when the police were allowed to talk to the recovering Mackenzie, she suddenly changed her testimony completely. Now Mackenzie claimed that she remembered almost nothing about the events of that night because she took alcohol and illegal substances. According to the girl, she had a lapse in memory after she got behind the wheel, and how Davian was in the car, she has no idea. However, the facts were to the contrary. The surveillance cameras were able to track the first part of the route the car had taken, and the footage clearly showed that Mackenzie was driving slowly and according to the rules until she suddenly turned onto a road leading to an industrial zone. Moreover, it turned out that Mackenzie had driven the entire route both ways several days earlier, and her car had been seen there at various times by at least a dozen witnesses. Back to normal. After being discharged from the hospital, Mackenzie recovered quickly enough and tried to get back to her old, carefree life. She had no remorse and was confident that she could get away with it. Mackenzie was once again active on social media, meeting with friends and making plans for the future. In September, she decided to go to a concert of her favorite band playing in a neighboring city. At that time, the bones of her legs had not yet fully fused, but this did not stop her, and she appeared on the concert stage in a wheelchair. At the same time, she wore bright makeup, dressed provocatively, took selfies with friends, and posted them on her account. In October, when Sharilla was on her feet, she went to a Halloween celebration dressed up in a pre-made costume. Mackenzie lived life to the fullest and even made new acquaintances, but on November 4th, 2022, she was taken into custody. Trial and Sentencing It took the investigation just over three months to gather the necessary evidence and proof to bring the case to trial. 
Mackenzie was charged with premeditated aggravated double murder and possession and use of a controlled substance that was found in her pocket and detected in her blood. The defendant changed her testimony several times, first citing a lapse in memory, and then, when her friend testified in court as a witness to whom she revealed her plan, Mackenzie changed tactics, saying that she wanted to die with her lover. But even here there were immediately discovered inconsistencies, because she had previously fastened herself with a seatbelt. On August 21, 2023, Sharilla was found guilty of all charges. However, an important nuance was taken into account, namely, at the time of the crime, she was not yet 18 years old, it was five days before her majority, so she was tried as a minor. Under state law, she was entitled to at least two consecutive sentences of 15 years for each murder, without parole. But because of her young age, she was allowed to serve the two sentences concurrently, meaning she would be eligible for parole in 15 years. By then, Mackenzie would be 33 years old. Both sides were unhappy with the court's decision. Family members of the deceased young people said they would seek a review of the case in order to increase the punishment, and parents and Mackenzie's lawyer, on the contrary, considered the sentence too harsh and filed an appeal. However, the judge left the sentence unchanged, noting that he did not believe that Sharilla would leave prison after 15 years. The defendant herself, in his opinion, did not repent for the evil she had committed, behaved arrogantly and even insolently towards the court. But now she will have enough time to seriously consider her heinous act. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click on the bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.